Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to the call today and thank you for joining us for our conversation with Dean Christopher Long in the College of Arts and Letters here at Michigan State University. So my name is Carly Lizay and I will be acting as your moderator for our discussion today. Um, a little bit about myself. I am going into my senior year and I'm a double major with English and Communications and I am currently interning for the College of Arts and Letters Advancement Office here at MSU. So before we begin, for anyone who might be new to Zoom, you will see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any questions on any of the topics that Dean Long will be discussing, feel free to leave a question in the Q&A button and I will see the question and I will propose the question to Dean Long during the Q&A session at the end of the discussion. I would also just like to let everyone know that this event today is being recorded and will later be posted to the college YouTube channel for anyone who wants to go back and watch something you may have missed, or if you are unable to attend today, um, you will be able to go back and watch it. And then just so everyone knows, the only faces that will be shown on the recording are the presenters. So, I would now love to give a warm introduction to our speaker today, who is Dean Christopher Long. He serves as the Dean for the College of Arts and Letters here at MSU and is also a professor of philosophy. Dean Long started his tenure at MSU in 2015 and has been continuously committed to expanding our liberal arts research and teaching through enriching graduate and undergraduate education, deepening our commitment to equity, recruiting and retaining some world-class faculty and constantly creating new opportunities for collaboration with our community partners. So some of the topics for discussion today will be the state of the college as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, our current situation with health and safety here at MSU, our college priorities, and then ways as an alumni and friend that you can help the college as well. So I would give a warm welcome to Dean Long and Dean Long, you now have the floor. Thank you, Carly. It is wonderful to be with everyone. Thanks to everyone for uh, taking time to um, out of your schedule today to, to be with us this afternoon. I want to begin uh, by asking you to join with me uh, for a brief moment of silence for uh, George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and now uh, Rashid Brooks. Thank you. It is, of course, a very difficult time for us uh, in, the, in this country at the moment, and we're joining together and gathering here um, with that, first of all, in our minds. And I'm very grateful, Carly, for your wonderful introduction and for your service as moderator. I, I appreciate all the work that you're putting into making this webinar possible. Um, in, in light of the current situation, I thought I would begin by talking a little bit about uh, the work that we're doing in the College of Arts and Letters around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as uh, many of you know, we uh, did a very uh, thorough uh, strategic planning process uh, a few years back that focused on core values of the college. And, and one of the main core values that we identified was equity diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, so that continues to be a, a core priority of ours as we think about what the current moment with respect to um, the, the protests we're seeing across the nation are asking us to consider things like systemic racism and, uh, and all of the ways in which institutions are structured um, in inequitable ways. We've been focusing on that for quite a, for quite a while in, in the college, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that we're doing. Uh, but I wanted to just give you a, a couple of indicators uh, here at the start. First of all, um, I am, as uh, some of you might know, uh, co-chairing the university level uh, vice president uh, for a chief diverse and chief diversity officer a search that's going on at the university right now. That was a priority that President Stanley established uh, when he first arrived, and I am co-chairing that with Melissa Wu, and we are in the middle of a, uh, a search process. 
which as you can imagine is a bit of a challenge to do during this, these distancing times. But we are uh, at the phase of that where we're, we're reviewing candidates and we're hoping to have um, candidates finalists on campus at the, at the beginning of the fall semester. Whatever on campus might mean, uh, it, it may be Zoom uh, meetings at that point. Uh, so if you have people in mind who you think would be wonderful chief diversity officers for the university, please uh, send the names my way. We, we are still looking for nominations in that regard. We've also spent a lot of time uh, in the college creating uh, structures to support the work of a minoritized faculty and uh, particularly faculty uh, of color who are doing uh, work around social justice issues, racial justice issues. And I'm very happy to say that we are, we'll have a, a number of faculty who will, if all goes well in the next two weeks at the board meeting, um, which it will, uh, it will be given granted tenure. So we're, we're, we're really working very hard to focus on faculty development in, in this area. Um, Dean Long, there was a question that came up um, about the new African American and African Studies Department. So what will that new African American and African Studies Department look like and what will be like the student experience and research focus at MSU? Yeah, thank you, Carly. This is a, this is a, a critical new initiative, a, a new department. We have had for a long time a program in African American and African Study. It was the graduate level program, interdisciplinary program. And one of the challenges that we've had uh, with uh, that structure, having it as a program rather than a department, is that we weren't able to really hire into the unit in a strategic way. And so uh, we had uh, a, a we've had graduate students over the years and faculty over the years advocating for this. And finally, in 2019, last year, July 1st, we were able to announce the creation of the new Department of African American and African Studies. And I am thrilled to be able to uh, welcome on July 1st, Ruth Nicole Brown, who will be the inaugural chair for African American and African Studies. We've also hired a second faculty member named Tamara Lomax, who will also be joining us this fall in, in the department. And we'll begin the process now of building the department out further with faculty from both within in the MSU community and then also continuing to look outside for, for faculty members to, to join us. The focus of the department will be, um, will be African diaspora broadly understood, but with a real focus on global black feminism. And I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Ruth Nicole Brown to the university. She's a, a visionary creative leader who is very student focused. She brings art and, um, and cultural studies into this uh, department in a really exciting way. Her area of focus is black girlhood studies. And so we are, we're gonna begin to build up some real strengths in this area. One of the things that is critical about having a department is that we'll be able to build out the major and build out uh, a minor and attract students uh, to, to the program, both undergraduate and graduate students. So uh, over the course of the next year, we'll be working really intentionally about uh, both of, in, in both of those areas. The graduate program, we're hoping to have reopened not this fall, but the fall after this as we move forward. But we're, we're, we're working very, very closely on that. And, and the student experience is gonna be pretty exciting because there's gonna be a real effort to combine the theoretical approaches to black studies together with the practical engagement with communities, both local regional and, and then also national and international as well. So a student should expect to have uh, a, a really remarkable experience in, in, in the program. And it's also an important part of our strategy to diversify our student uh, body in the, in the College of Arts and Letters. So I am uh, really excited about that. I wanted to begin with that conversation around uh, our, some of our efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I want to uh, move on, though, to talk a little bit about the whole question of, of health and safety. I know many of you are thinking about, okay, well, how, how did we navigate this whole process with res respect to the move to remote teaching in 
mid March, and you know, Carly, I'll, I will ask you at some point, you know, how your experience was. But yes, middle of March, we basically had a a, a two hour window when the president and provost met with the deans at 10 a.m. I think it was you know March 11th, and um, we we were told, okay, at noon we're going online, all online, and so as you can imagine, it was quite a daunting uh, transition. And I I do use the use the make the distinction between remote teaching and learning versus online teaching and learning. We, we like we, we say that we moved to remote teaching and learning at that time because that was not a planned um, and 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 designed shift that happened. We just had to do it because of health and safety reasons. Uh, and and now we are very much in the in the phase over the summer here and looking toward the fall of working on designing online courses as well as hybrid courses and in-person courses that will really meet the needs of our students. But Carly, what was your experience with uh, the shift to remote teaching and learning? Yeah, so I was personally, I was in Milwaukee when this happened. I was interviewing for a position and a lot of the students around me from different colleges were getting emails um, and I didn't expect MSU to go online, but then once they did, it was definitely a big shock at first. Um, it was kind of hard to get adjusted to all of online classes, but I will say that all of my professors did a great job of transitioning and making sure that the semester did roll smoothly after that. And they were really accommodating in terms of students who may not have had access to like internet connection or anything like that. They were super accommodating, super understanding. They knew that this was gonna be a tough time for us and we knew that it was tough for them to have to transition so fast. So I would say it was definitely a learning curve, but. I'm glad that um, we were able to transition pretty smoothly. Great, we, 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 we just have an amazing team of education technologists in the College of Arts and Letters. Scott Shuperai is our Assistant Dean for Education Technology and Research, and he and his whole team just did an unbelievable job helping the university make this transition. And in fact, many of the, uh, initiatives that were sponsored at the university level with respect to the, the training of faculty and providing resources for them to move online were provided by our education technology team. So we really had a, a wonderful uh, uh, team effort and all of the collaborations we've established over the, over the course of the years really came in handy during this time of, of real intense transition to remote teaching and learning. And now we are um, in massive uh, planning phase for a return to campus as a kind of big reopening campus initiative that has 21 subcommittees. I am co-chairing the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Subcommittee, and we're focusing on all of those areas around reopening that impact um, vulnerable populations, minoritized communities, and 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 really. Uh, we are focusing on that subcommittee on trying to make sure that we are paying attention to uh, students with disabilities and other sorts of needs that will be emerging in this massive process to bring students back on campus. Happy to answer some questions about that if you have it. We are uh, looking at, um, because of the social distancing requirements in the fall, we are going to have to have we're, we're going to have to have about half of our classes that are going to be online because we have to have six feet of difference, uh, six feet of distance between students and classrooms. And as you can imagine, if you have a big classroom with um, you know 200 people in it, you can't have that. You have we're going to basically be at 25% capacity. So uh, we're looking at a, a number of online courses. 50% of our courses online. Another 25% probably will be hybrid, and then probably about 25% will be in person. And we are talking about how is testing going to happen, how is contact tracing going to happen, how are we going to help people remember to wear their masks, keep their masks on, when do you need to wear masks. So as you can imagine, it's, it's a daunting set of issues that we're, we're thinking through. And I, I keep saying that every time I think we get uh, focused on one issue, there's five others, and each of those five has five, five more. So we are very busy this summer working on, working on, on that. And I would encourage people to look at the, um, the coronavirus page on the MSU website where you can see the subcommittees that we have um, operating on this. 
So I want to talk uh, briefly too about uh, some of the major questions that I'm sure everybody has around the, the budget. The coronavirus um, has had it, and, and the shift to remote teaching has had a massive um, uh, impact on the university's budget. And as you can imagine, we we actually sent when we sent students home, the residence halls um, actually provided. A re refund to parents for for the monies that they had paid for the rest of the semester here in East Lansing. So that money uh, was was part of it. Obviously, when we didn't play uh, the NTAA tournament, there was a huge loss of revenue from the from basketball. Um, and and so there's an enormous uh, set of things that we're we're dealing with. We have been asked by the university this year to find 4% in, in recurring uh, costs for uh, the budget reduction. And we anticipate because the, the state is facing some massive budget cuts themselves, uh, some further budget cuts in, in the years to come. So this is really causing us uh, a challenge because we, we operate a pretty efficient and, and focused um, program in the College of Arts and Letters and so much of our budget is bound up in salaries for people and so any cut like this is uh, is very difficult to take particularly when we want to in our decision making put people first and one of the things that we did early on was with our chairs and directors and our College Advisory Council we articulated a set of of, of principles uh, aligned with our values and with our top priorities that would uh, that would drive our strategic decision making and you can find that on our uh, website and on the Cal website cal.msu.edu under um, values and priorities you can see the the document that we put together for that and that's really designed to help us um, make decisions with respect to uh, budget reductions we're going to be engaging the chairs the directors and also our faculty in a process that will allow us to make some decisions that are uh, going to be difficult, but we're we're committed to making them in a shared, in in a shared way. So yeah, Dean Long, in relation to the changing environment at MSU, um, a question that came up was, what does a hybrid classroom look like, and what are hybrid class classes? If you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Yes, excellent. Thank you for the questions. This is this is um, an important one. So, uh, hybrid class, a hybrid course can mean a variety of different things. But in in general, the way we're using it for the planning for the fall is that we're we're having a component of the course online, so that there will be you know rather than having let's say for example a large lecture hall with a faculty in the room lecturing. We can deliver some of that content online, and then we can split that large lecture hall potentially up into smaller groups in, in, in big, in, so taking 25 uh, students each and putting them in, into that room that was designed to hold 100, but um, because we need six feet between everybody, we could bring those students into that space, have uh, conversations, do uh, group work, do certain kinds of things that you would want to do in the classroom, and um, and and so it's kind of fluid between being online and and in person. So that's one of the main uh, ways in which we're going to try to navigate the situation this fall. And then also related to um, the changing environments is another question that came up was how are the residence halls going to be handled? So the, the residence halls have a, uh, a plan a, around um, ensuring that there's going to be a, enough distancing and also testing. I think the testing and tracing component of this uh, process is going to be an, an important one. Decisions haven't been absolutely made yet about exactly how that testing is going to happen. We were just talking on Monday in the, in the reopening task force around the question about the question of whether every student was going to have to be tested when they come back on campus and, and how we would uh, how we would proceed that way but we will have protocols around testing and also around tracing uh, if we test people who are positive who have they been in contact with and we and we will have we've got designated areas 
for um, for quarantining people so that they can um, so that we can make sure that the rest of the population is is safe. But as you can imagine, I mean, we are actually here in Michigan. We're doing pretty well right now with respect to the numbers and and the, the flattening of the curve. We're starting to reopen a little bit. And we're watching very carefully. Of course, this is July, so um, you know the, the the numbers around the virus might be a little bit uh, reduced because of the warm weather. Um, but in the fall, that's going to be a big challenge. And then when you bring in forty five thousand students from across the globe, um, we're we're really in in for a an interesting dynamic with respect to needing to be able to test people effectively, trace who they've connected with, and isolate them when they, when they need to do that. Um, although we have um, uh, confidence that we have a plan in place that will allow us to do that effectively. Mm -hmm. And then related to the issue of students having access to their work from these online platforms, how do you make sure that your indigenous students without internet connectivity are able to access their coursework? Yes, now you're into the, the, some of the core questions that we're looking at in the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, subcommittee. You know, we saw, we experienced that very much when we moved to remote teaching, where it, you know, students, you know, when students are on campus, we have uh, a lot of control over the, what access they have to internet, to computers, computer labs, and, and facilities, and things like that. Once we sent them home, they went back into uh, their their communities and so the question of equity becomes a massive massive one in that context with respect to uh, this fall we uh, we have done a number of things around this one is that we've we've tried to identify partnerships with other colleges and universities and even with uh, other industries and, and and partners that can provide Wi-Fi uh, for us free Wi-Fi we have um, Michigan State is 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 part of a uh, of a network of of Wi-Fi uh, connections called EduRoam, so that anytime you're near another institution of higher education, your MSU uh, credentials will allow you to log into um, into that Wi-Fi hotspot and therefore also get access to the internet. So we're trying to provide maps with for our students with, okay, local um, connection air points. We've got a lot of them around Michigan, but we also know that one of the challenges that we're gonna have is we're gonna have students from across the country, some of which will be, some of whom will be coming to East Lansing, but some of whom won't. And particularly with respect to our international students, we have uh, a, a major challenge because of time zone issues and, and, and making sure that they're feeling welcomed at a time when it's gonna be very difficult for some of them to travel even here to, to Michigan State University campus. So th these are some of the daunting challenges that, that we have. All right, I wanna move uh, on as, uh, uh, unless there are some other questions associated currently with, with the kind of reopening process and all that, I'm also, I'm happy to, to answer that. One of the things we've had to learn how to live with as I'm sure you're all doing, is uncertainty and trying to, you know, figure out how um, to identify questions that we need to answer and recognize that we don't always have the absolute answer for these questions uh, as we move as we move forward. So we're we're, we're definitely working on that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the the, the college uh, priorities next, and um, we did already mention the new Department of African American and African Studies, and that that remains a, a top priority for us in the college. As you can imagine, with the with the budget reductions and what the president has uh, indicated is a hiring chill, because he doesn't want to use the word freeze. So I'm grateful for the chill. The question is, how cold is this hiring chill going to be? Um, but we are committed and we have a long-standing commitment with the provost office to continue to do the work that we need to do around AAAS, African, and Af African American and African Studies, and, and we will uh, continue uh, to focus on that. That is, from my perspective, a core uh, strategy for us to address the institutional racism that we need to face uh, in the current moment in the history of, of the country and, and as we see the protests and uh, and and 
and the, the energy around this, I think we have a real opportunity to model um, lasting change here at MSU with a department that will focus on the very kinds of issues that we're, that we're looking at, um, and particularly as we look at issues um, connected with African American women and girls, and, and and studying those areas. So I think we're we're very excited ab about that. A second area of priority is many of you've heard me talk about an arts strategy that we have been focused on here at Michigan State University, and the strategy uh, has been developed in consultation with an external consultant, and we've really focused on trying to bring the arts into the heart of the Michigan State land grant mission and to bring the creativity of the arts into dialogue with the, the sciences and social sciences and, and the professional schools in, in the university. It's really an important commitment that we have um, to, to put the arts at the heart of the MSU mission. And particularly now, as we recognize all of the ways in which the arts can empower us to imagine new possibilities for a more meaningful future. That's, that's critical. The Department of Art, Art History and Design, the Department of Theater. In the Department of Theater, we have a new chair coming in this year, Stephen Benedetto, and he'll be starting in July. We're very excited about that so that they can continue to advance their work in theater. And the Department of Art, Art History and Design has been doing an amazing job in uh, revitalizing its curriculum and, and working on its bylaws and, and, and its Masters of Fine Arts program and so we're we're really in a in a great position with regard to that department and i am hopeful that we'll be able to do a search for a chair of that department in the year to come we're continuing to build up our undergraduate majors across the across the college and and to to draw on more students particularly as the the budget situation uh, comes into more focus and we are doing a strategic planning process at the university level so the numbers of students who are part of our college is, is always is going to be uh, an important component moving forward when we think about um, budget issues. A number of the things that we're looking at as a country in terms of our own sort of self-identity and, and, and asking questions about culture and, and racism and, and institutional inequity is at the heart of the work that we do. We have obviously um, the the Serling Institute of Jew Jewish Studies, which has been a, a, a leader in helping us think through some of these issues, both in terms of our engagement with the engineering and science fields, but also in terms of really addressing some of these very difficult culture questions to, to make sure that MSU and, and the United States is a more inclusive and, and equitable place. Um, another question that has come up is, how is the College of Arts and Letters breathing STEM-related initiatives here at MSU? Yes, I think one of the things that we are um, aware of is, you know, the, there's a, a strong focus on uh, STEM fields, not only at MSU, but I think more broadly across the country. And uh, particularly as we look at the pandemic that we're facing, that there is a uh, great deal of attention around the health sciences in particular. And we have a huge opportunity in, in our college, both because we have faculty who are focused on, um, on health sciences, on both in terms of our longstanding strength in bioethics, but also we have uh, a number of scholars who are looking at um, the, the, the questions uh, around health disparity and how that, and how, um, you know, questions like access to healthcare and and vaccines and other things play themselves out in specific communities. And I always remind people when they want to try to find a, a purely engineering or STEM focused solution to problems, well, you know, you can have the best vaccine in the world, but if you don't know how to empower people to actually take the vaccine and you don't understand about culture and you don't understand about communities and histories of communities, then you're really going to be powerless to, to be able to address some of the intractable problems that, that we face. So we are, um, we are focusing our, some of our attention in those areas as we move forward. We also have, as many of you know, the um, uh, programs in experience architecture, which is really about creating um, 
human-centered digital experiences uh, for, for people to address issues of, um, of you know, in challenges that are, that are very difficult to, to address and also to make sure that our technologies are oriented toward our human capacities in an important way. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, also one of our, our top majors is graphic design, which is also very much in, in, engaged with uh, the STEM fields as, as well. We have in theater, the other thing I would mention in, in the Department of Theater, where we have a, a longstanding focus on neurodiverse audiences, as audience members with, for example, autism and, and other uh, neurodiversity. We have programs and things that we've developed and, and whole shows that we're developing for them. So we're looking to, to, to um, advance our, our work in those areas as well. You're, yeah. Related um, related to theater, one of the questions that did come up was, will the Department of Theater Productions be allowed to continue in the fall? Yeah, so we are actively engaged with that whole, with, with that question. As you can imagine, um, when you're only allowed to use 25% um, capacity for your venues, um, that is it causing us some uh, some concern with respect to how we're doing uh, theatrical performances and, and also exhibitions and all of the kinds of uh, in ways of engaging our community around the arts. Our theater department, however, is amazingly creative, as you all know. And uh, I have been so impressed by the ways in which they have, uh, even during the remote uh, learning phase of this this spring, shifted very quickly to uh, online engagement with students. In fact, some of the students uh, started their own business offering acting classes for, and, and, for, for and, and actually creating whole shows for community members and with community members here in East Lansing. And, and it was, it's been just amazing to see them do that. So I'm imagining that in the fall, we're, we're gonna have some combination uh, of, of in-person and online uh, dimensions of this but we are actively sort of trying to figure out how we can do this because uh, a, an enormous amount of what the Department of Theater depends on is the, the ticket sales through the shows that they produce. And when you're, when you're only able to have 25% of your audience in the, in the space, it's gonna be a challenge to put those programs forward. Um, one of the questions that has come up was, um, how has the college identified its ethnic diversity goals and strategies for students, faculty, and staff? And um, how are we working to change or improve like ratios of ethnically diverse students, faculty, and staff? So we, we are in the process with our, um, with our chairs and directors of um, looking at specific numbers with regard to percentages. Uh, I, I will say that we have, um, as I mentioned earlier, a um, amazing cohort of five uh, uh, faculty of color coming up for tenure and getting tenure this this year. So we actually, you know, the, we are driving uh, the numbers in terms of faculty of color at the university in a pretty substantive way. But we need to be doing better and more. Um, uh, we need to be doing more in, the, in this area. And so one of the ways that we're trying to drive that change is by um, focusing on our curriculum. The Cara Solano has been working with our, um, with our committee, the um, Committee on Inclusive Practices, SIPSI, uh, the College Committee on Inclusive Practices. And um, that committee is working intentionally on uh, transforming our curriculum so that it focuses on um, a range of issues that are uh, relevant to the current moment that we're living through in, in, the, in the country, thinking about issues of, of uh, structural inequity, institutional racism, um, and diversity in its broadest sense, because we're, we're, we have the uh, program in American Indian and Indigenous Studies, and, and they're working very closely with um, our language programs to begin to offer uh, Anishinaabemowin, which is the local dialect of Ojibwe language, 
here at MSU so that we can attract more students from indigenous communities in Michigan to the university and support them once they're here. So the, the approach that we're taking is really a, a broad one and it's, and it's focused on um, issues of building out into the curriculum uh, of focus areas that will be attracted to a wider diversity of students who are committed to bringing their values into the world and bringing their commitments about culture change and, and changing society into the world. And that's really uh, a core part of what the College of Arts and Letters is, is all about. And, and we're, we're working very hard with our, with our faculty and with our communications team to make sure that that is at the forefront of what we're working on as we move forward. And related to that, another question that came up was given the recent national events and discussions, has the college planned any additional initiatives to promote minoritized students and faculty to succeed in their degrees and careers? So uh, I, I think the best way that we can make progress in that is to uh, create the kind of uh, curriculum that is focused on these issues and have that curriculum drive our uh, hiring practices with respect to uh, faculty. And that's really been the focus of, of our efforts in, in the college is to um, kind of take a very, um, or I, I would say holistic approach uh, to this so that it is not um, just about, you know, adding an initiative here or an initiative there, but it's actually a, uh, a, an integrated holistic values driven approach to the kinds of changes that we, we need to make. One of the things that's been uh, uh, challenging for our, uh, for our junior faculty as they move through the tenure and promotion process is that the kind of scholarship that is most exciting to them involves a wider diversity of activities than is um, traditionally recognized. So for example, you know, we have uh, the, a standard thing to do would be to, in, in the humanities, would be to write a, a book as on your way to, to get tenure and promotion. Um, but we have a lot of faculty members who not only want to write a book, but also want to be engaged in communities in substantive ways that actually transform those communities. So we're building in the infrastructure to reward those kinds of scholarly activities that are directly engaged with the world. On the graduate level, we have made um, some pretty significant progress in uh, retaining and recruiting um, graduate students of color. We have in the English department in particular, a program called Muse, which is um, mentoring underrepresented students in English. Very, uh, very uh, nice name for, for that program, creative name. And, um, and that program has uh, allowed the English department to recruit and retain a, a higher percentage of uh, students of color than they have in the past. And now the, uh, work we have ahead of us is to make sure that the community that we've created around them supports the kind of work that they want to do. So that, that's where we're really focusing our efforts is on this kind of structural uh, areas. It is, it is, um, it, it's, it's the kind of work that I'm, um, I think needs to be done, but it's also, um, it's also sort of grassroots work that's not necessarily um, in you know big in, in, in initiatives that are um, that are flashy these are this is into the roots of the college that we're working and that's where I think we need to work to make the kind of change we need to make another question that we had come up Dean Long is that many people claim that an online course may not be the exact same as an in-person class um, even if it's a large lecture with little interaction and then there's the question of um, why should a student pay more for the online experience um, as they would for an in-person experience? And um, how would you respond to this criticism? Yes, this is, um, this is a, a, an important question. I think, you know, first of all, I, it's, it's very clear, and I'm sure Carly, you can attest to this, that, you know, students want to come to college and be a college. They want, a, they want the residential experience. We want, we, we want that for them. We're, we've long time, been, we've been, committed to that as a university and the college as well. Um, and of course, we also probably all need to recognize that 
students come to Michigan State precisely not to be socially distant from one another, to be actually socially connected with one another and to be, and to be also physically close to each other. So this is a big challenge that we're going to have, that we're having in the, coming in the, in the fall. You're going to have quite an interesting senior year, Carly. This is going to be pretty, pretty, uh, we're in uncharted territory. Uh, having said all that, we've also made pretty substantive, it's very substantive investments in the college around online teaching and learning. A lot of our in-person classes are enhanced by online components. We have online chats that go on in between classes. We have uh, other um, way, modes of engagement through digital technologies that uh, enhance the learning experience, even for in-person classes. One of the things that we pride ourselves on in the College of Arts and Letters is that we have a deep understanding of the human condition through the traditions of the liberal arts, and we have a very sophisticated understanding of new technologies. One of our responsibilities is to empower students to learn how to use these technologies to enrich their lives and to be, and to be engaged with, each, with one another in new ways. And the initiatives that we're, we're undertaking, there's an enormous amount of learning that's going on across the faculty around online teaching and learning and the affordances and also the limitations of the, that mode of teaching. There's a lot of studies that are out there that show that um, online learning can be as effective, if not more effective in some cases, than in-person teaching. And so what we're really focusing on is how are our uh, pedagogical objectives and our learning objectives for students best be best able to be um, uh, met in a context in which health and safety require us to be at distance from one another. So, you know, if you were asking me, would I like to have this many courses online? No, I, I would not. I'm, you know, I'm the dean of a in-residence, uh, you, you know, college, and we pride ourselves on the that residential experience. I have a daughter who's in 11th grade and who is just can't wait to go to college and be in college. That's what you, you know, that's what, what's happening um, for her. And, and so, however, we also in a, in a position where we need to be um, mindful of issues around safety. And it's not just safety for our students. Um, a third of our faculty are over the age of 60 and they're in a vulnerable population. And so when you have this kind of mix of uh, students coming from all over the world on, into this location and uh, in, being in face-to-face -face relationship with uh, faculty and, and one another, but many faculty who are in a, a vulnerable population, we have to take precautions to make sure that we're doing what we can to ensure the safety of everybody as we undertake this. But boy, I mean, it's, this is quite a, quite a new territory we are, we are experiencing and everyone in higher education is doing it. I am convinced though that we are, we're learning an enormous amount from this that, and, and an enormous amount that will help us moving forward. I mean, I'm even seeing that in, in some of the interactions that I'm having with my staff um, through virtual modalities because we're actually able to connect with one another in a more um, robust and easy way, and I'm. We're going to continue to do that even when we're back together, when we are when we are able to be uh, physically back together, because we've learned some things about how to do some of that. And related to um, the changing environments and classes, a lot of classes going online. Um, are you anticipating a significant decrease in fall enrollment? We are uh, doing everything we can, <laughs> everything we can think of to uh, ensure that that does not happen. We uh, were, were worried a little bit about that at the beginning of uh, all of this. We have seen an uptick, in, we, we saw a slight uptick in the number of deposits that we received this year. And um, we have been working very closely with our advisors and with uh, the new student orientation to, to try to make sure we uh, yield as many of those people who made deposits as possible. Um, there, there's a, a whole a series of things that we talk about in the admissions process around you know, the melt, that is the number of people who make deposits and who then don't come. And we're, we're trying to 
uh, not have a big melt this <laughs> this year by by really trying to be engaged. And we, we've had letter writing campaigns. I mean, some of you might have been asked to write some letters to incoming students. I hope um, that some of you were able to do that. I wrote a number of letters just to welcome them, make them feel uh, excited about coming to MSU. And, um, you know, it's a daunting and uncertain time. One of the challenges we are going to face this year is around um, international students. They make up 11% of our population and student population, but they account for almost 18% of the tuition revenue uh, because of the out-of-state tuition and also some of the other costs that, uh, that, uh, that come with our international students. And because we are going to have a significant decrease in international students, we actually are going to have a bigger class of domestic students and even and students from within Michigan, I think, because we're making up the, the numbers of the base because the international students' numbers have declined a little bit. So we'll, I'm, I'm confident we'll have, um, and we'll, we'll have good enrollments. Um, the makeup of the enrollments of the class will be a little bit different. It won't be as heavily international as it has in the past, unfortunately. And then going off of that and relating back to health and safety, another question that we had submitted was, what provisions have you made in the office to keep yourself and your staff safe during working hours? That's a great question. Thank you, whoever asked it for a concern, <laughs> concern for us. We, I, I am so proud of our uh, staff who were have been just unbelievably patient and resilient and creative. I mean, we, uh, I told you that we went to remote teaching on the 11th of March, and the whole question then was also, well, how long can we keep, you know, the, the staff and administrators and, and other faculty on campus? And we moved pretty quickly to remote working and partly we were able to do that very quickly because we have, as many of you I think have heard me talk about uh, our culture of care initiative where we really focused on creating a caring environment for our staff, our students, our faculty, and so that they can do their very best work. And as part of that initiative, we had done some work in the fall to create a remote working um, a policy. And so we were already thinking about remote working long before we knew anything about coronavirus at all. And so we were able to roll that out very quickly. Now there's um, challenges with respect to, uh, um, you know, working from home and making sure everybody has the internet connection they need and chairs that are comfortable enough to do, let alone trying to deal with, you know, as you may hear at some point, my dog barking or children they're taking care of or, or partners that are also co-working in spaces. So we've had a lot of things to deal with with that. As we move into the fall, we have been pretty clear about um, saying that we're going to put people first uh, in our decision-making process. And that means in part that if you, if you can work from home, we encourage you to work from home. We recognize we're going to need some more people in the spaces as students come back, as faculty uh, move in and out of them. So we're working on a, a plan to have uh, the, the, the distancing in place, the, the PPE, the personal protective equipment, the masks and other things that people need to, to feel safe. It's going to be a very interesting fall because uh, I don't know how you feel Carly about wearing a mask but I, I go out grocery shopping and have my mask on and then I can't wait till I get in the car and take it off so we're gonna have to be really intentional about wearing masks to protect each other. Okay and then another question we had come up is um, more experts are talking about colleges opening in the fall only to close due to COVID in October. Um, has MSU begun to have internal conversations about the next stage of contingency planning and if so what do those plans look like? Yeah, so we've already started to talk about this. So right now the plan for the fall is this, we're gonna bring uh, the, the in-person classes we're going to have starting in early September with that, that uh, breakdown of modalities that I talked about, about 50% online, 25% hybrid, and 25% in-person. That's gonna be our goal. Students on campus and, um, and coming back in that regard. And then what we have decided is that at Thanksgiving, 
the in-person phase of the semester will, will end and so students will go back home for Thanksgiving. We will continue to deliver uh, the curriculum in an online modality for the rest of the semester and have the full 15 week semester, but that last part from Thanksgiving through until uh, the holidays, uh, the winter break holidays will be in, um, in a, an online modality. So that's a huge part of our challenge right now is getting the faculty kind of re um, organize and, and design their courses so that they're, they're, they've thought about how well, if they're gonna have tests and they need an in-person test, they should do that before Thanksgiving. And then after Thanksgiving, maybe there's online components, papers and other things that they can do. Obviously in the arts, there's a huge challenge. We've got you know, things like pottery and painting, very difficult, ceramics, very difficult to do in you know, a remote or an, uh, an online environment. So we wanna make sure our studios, our acting studios and, and the theater department as well are doing the things they need to do in person before Thanksgiving so that then we can do some things online afterwards. We do, there is, you know, an anticipation that there'll be a resurgence of the virus at that point and then into the, into the spring semester. So we're thinking there's some creative thinking going on on, on, the, on the spring semester about, uh, about that. So Carly, we, we may have to be thinking about, hopefully we'll be, everybody will be ready for an actual in-person graduation for your graduation, but the spring semester could be uh, kind of the reverse where we start online and move into in-person later once the worst uh, months of the virus move, move, to move away from us. So, but, uh, but, but there's, some, there's some real creative thinking happening around the spring that we need to uh, flesh out before we uh, talk more broadly about it, I think. Okay, and then another question we had is, is there a danger of MSU reducing a focus on humanities as a core learning component, component in deference to job-oriented curricula in this budget-driven environment? <sighs> Yes, there is. It's constantly what I'm, uh, I'm, I am um, concerned about. But I will let, let me put my um, hopeful hat on, um, which is uh, a hat I am very comfortable wearing, uh, which is that I, I do think some of what we're learning in this whole process, and I, and I think it is connected with the pandemic and with the uh, the requirement that we all slow down, um, take some time uh, to be with our families in a, in a different way than we are when we're rushing around and busy and at our various jobs away from home. This period of, of, of time has caused, I think, a lot of self-reflection for people. I think you're seeing a lot of people kind of asking themselves, what you know, what is meaningful to me? What, what is uh, uh, the, the, the course of my life? What is it, what, what track is it on? And um, I honestly do believe that part of what we're seeing in the strong and passionate voices of protest across the country is a result of having had some time to reflect in addition to the anger and pain and, and rightful um, rage that is coming from the violence that we're seeing, the state-sponsored violence that we're seeing out there. But it's also bound up with this time we've had to slow down and think and reflect. I think that will help us in the uh, arts and in the humanities as we have students whose lives have been shaped to a great degree by this experience where they will be saying, you know, you know, what is, why is this structural racism in place? Why are we continuing to do the same things over and over again without having it be different? Why can't we have a different uh, way of being together, different modes of policing, different, um, modes of engagement with each other, even across distance. And I think that will help us. Um, having said that, um, we're, we are in a, uh, an environment where the economic 
downturn is real and people are gonna be concerned about making sure that they have the resources that they need to live a meaningful life. But the, 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 the differentiator for us as a college has always been that we empower our students to consider the questions of what a meaningful life looks like. And that's, that's gonna be, I think, increasingly more important as we move forward. And then Dean Long, with these challenges that the college is facing, um, what are some ways that our donors and alumni um, can help if they are looking for ways to help students or help faculty during this time? Yes, uh, I appreciate that question, Carly. Well, we, we've been talking a number in a number of, uh, uh, we've talked a number of times about the commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion. One of the best ways to uh, support that effort is along the lines of what I talked about with respect to graduate education. Our graduate students are future faculty members. And if you want to have an impact on the future of higher education, then we need to diversify the number of graduate students that we have and teach the inclusive pedagogical practices that will allow them to move into uh, teaching positions across the country and uh, inspire new generations of students to um, think about these uh, massive cultural issues that we have to face. So, so a graduate assistantships has always been a top priority of mine for uh, fundraising. We have, uh, of course, a, a enormous uh, need for our students, our students who are, as we talked about earlier, in um, varying positions when they move into remote learning environments in, in home spaces. Uh, we've had some success with our student emergency fund and you know, scholarships for students and, and support for students is, is always a top priority for us. We have um, major needs with respect to uh, recruitment of diverse faculty members. So professorships and chairs is always a, is a top priority for us. And I would say um, we have this wonderful program in the Department of Art, Art History and Design, the Critical Race Residencies, and we've had this it's uh, some funding from the uh, MSU Federal Credit Union to uh, bring two residencies, two artists, one designer and one artist in, in residence to focus on the very issues that we're talking about, the intersection of, uh, of race and class and gender and, and bringing a very intersectional approach to their art, artistic practice. They're on, they come on campus for a year, they support one another, we bring that work into the community. And, and those residencies are, are funded, that have been funded for three years by the MSU, FCU. But the, the, the broader vision for that was to create faculty lines that where these residencies would potentially be um, transition positions to actual faculty lines. And I, I think those are the kinds of things that will actually make for uh, substantive structural transformation of the college and also of, of the university. Well, thank you so much, Dean Long. Um, I have been keeping an eye on the time and I see it is almost four o'clock. Um, I just wanted to say thank you everyone who participated. Thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you for just taking the time out of your day to be here with us. And thank you to Dean Long for your transparency and offering time for these important topics and conversations. As a student myself, it means a lot that all of our alumni and donors care so much about the college and its students. And I would also like to note that we will continue to be offering these types of conversations throughout the summer with our guest faculty speakers. So keep an eye out for an email communication um, shortly in the next probably couple weeks. So again, thank you to everyone for participating and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and go green. Go white. Thanks, Carly. Awesome job. Really appreciate your work. Bye. Bye.